How many is ready to jump in the word this morning? All right. So just a bit of a recap. So far in this series, we are, uh, we're in a series on the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, it's the greatest sermon that has ever been preached. And the last couple weeks, um, if I could not take too much time on this, uh, Magna already re-preached it, so I don't really need to go over it. But in the Sermon on the Mount so far, we, we talked about what made Jesus so popular. And we talked about what gave Jesus the authority that he needed to have. And in Hebrew, that word authority is called smika. Can you say that one more time? Smika. Right? In order to preach and teach uh, your own yoke, your own interpretation of the, the Hebrew scriptures, you had to have authority. And we unpacked what gave Jesus that smika to do and say the things that he did. And it makes the gospel make a lot more sense because almost every time Jesus opened his mouth, the religious establishment got upset with him. And the reason is, is because he taught it a different way than they were indoctrinating everybody else. And we, and we talked about how, how the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' manifest. And it's not just a manifesto for how we should act. Jesus actually goes right to the heart of it. And it's his manifesto on how we should think. And then we talked about um, what it looks like when we fail in that, both in our thoughts and in our actions, and how Jesus forgives the whole entire thing. Now, with that being said, I do promise us that we eventually will get into unpacking the Sermon on the Mount in detail with the Beatitudes and, and everything else. I struggled uh, in, in kind of praying and preparing for the message this morning because I just wanted to get right into the Beatitudes. And then for whatever reason, on Monday morning, the more I prayed, the more I sensed make the Sermon on the Mount come alive. And then I thought, Lord, I don't know if these people are tracking with me, if this is too much. Maybe." We... And he's like, no, you really need to. And then everything was confirmed when Mary came into the office. And, and when I got an email. Um... So Jacqueline and Mary kind of confirmed because because they're heading up this 10 days of prayer. And so I thought, well, prayer has a big thing to do with the Sermon on the Mount. We actually need to talk about that before we actually morning, I'm not asking permission, but I'll be polite. If I could have some permission to unpack a few more Hebraic culture and context in what Jesus preached. Are you guys going to be okay with that? Okay. This involves more Paleo Hebrew. Are we okay with the Paleo Hebrew? Okay. So last moving from a belief in Jesus Christ to putting our faith in Jesus Christ. But I almost did the message a disservice because I didn't talk about how that happens. Around what helps us move from belief to putting our faith in Jesus. Like if we were to ask a first century rabbi, what does it mean to put your faith in the Messiah? They would give us this kind of... Um, Fiddler on the roof response. How many is familiar with the old musical from like, I don't know, the 40s or 30s or 20s? A fiddler on the roof. If you were to ask a first century rabbi, how do I put my faith in the Messiah? They would say, Tefillah, Teshuva, Sadaka. Can you say that this morning? Tefillah, Teshuva, Sadaka. Let's say it again. Tefillah, Teshuva, Sadaka. One more time. Tefillah, Teshuva, Sadaka. Let's put it together really fast and pretend we're Hebrew. Tefila Teshuva Sadaka. Right, try it again. Tefila Teshuva Sadaka. Right, the fiddle on the roof. Tefila Teshuva Sadaka. When Paul wrote, you can put up the slide, Jeff, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, he says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. In his mind, as a first century rabbi, Paul would have been thinking, Tefila Teshuva Sadaka. Now today is the practical application for last week. And to do that, let's learn some Paleo Hebrew. If you missed last week and you never got to tune in online, um, Paleo Hebrew, basically, every single letter in the Hebrew alphabet, uh, it, it, they represent concepts. They, am I walking around too much, Jeff? 
Okay, they represent concepts, they represent numbers, um, they, uh, they, they, they have pictures that coincide with each letter. And then each letter has a figurative meaning and a literal meaning. And so when we put everything that we know about the Hebrew language together and we break it down into its letters, what the Paleo-Hebrew does is it creates like a mini-movie or a comic strip meaning for the said word. So that's Paleo-Hebrew. We'll go on to the next slide, Jeff. We're really working on trying to get those online to see the slides, and I don't have my clicker, so you're going to hear me pick on Jeff a lot today. I'm not angry at Jeff. It's not like he's slacking there in the back. You know, it's just I have to let him know when the next slide is. So, so the first step is to tefillah. Say that one more time. Tefillah. Say it again. Tefillah means call on the name of the Lord. And it originally carried this understanding of attachment or, or binding together. But over time, it took on the meaning for prayer. And tefillah is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. Next slide. It says, Seth also had a son, and he began to call on the name of the Lord. They began to tefillah. See, the context of Genesis 4, verse 26, is to show us the difference between Cain's lineage and Seth's lineage. Now, you've got to remember, everybody knows the story of Cain and Abel, right? Cain got jealous at his brother Abel's offering, and so he went out in the field, and he smoked him in the head with a rock, and he killed him. And then it went from that all the way to his great, great, great grandson, Lamech. He ended up killing somebody else, but he just didn't kill him and then leave him to rot in the dirt. He killed him, uh, him, and then the Bible says that he bragged about what he did. And now that is from Cain's line. That is what happens when we don't follow the Lord. And then Adam and Eve had another son, right? His name was Seth. And the Bible says that his descendants, they bound and they attached themselves to God by calling on the name of the Lord. Now, tefillah has three letters. Next slide. We're going to go through the first two. And I actually took the hieroglyph, the picture. Last year, I kind of, or last week, I put a modern twist on it. This week. and entered the temple from the east, right? The temple, when they built it, it faced east. And then, and then from the east side, there was a river that flowed east of it. They, they, they prophesied that Messiah would come from the east. Now, here's where it gets really, really tricky. Good things from God come from the east, but traveling east was always bad. When, when Cain was exiled, uh, he went east, right, to the land of Nod after he murdered his brother Abel. Uh, people traveled east when they went and built the Tower of Babel. When, when Abraham and Lot went their own separate ways, the Bible says that Lot traveled east to Sodom and Gomorrah. And when, when, when there was the, the exile, the tribe of Judah, they were exiled in, uh, to Babylon, and Babylon was in the east. So we could say this a couple different ways. One way is, is that if good things from God flow east to west, then it's best to flow east to west with them. Don't go against the rhythm of the kingdom. Run with the rhythm of the kingdom in the same direction. In other words, when we're getting in our vehicle, you just drove across Canada, you know this. If you're driving west and into the wind, you're paying a whole lot more gas on your mileage than if you're heading east and going back with the wind at your back. See, Russian coffin to Fila here. Uh, it's a huge play on words established in the Paleo Hebrew language 2,000 years before Jesus was born. Prayer is about turning our head and looking towards the sun. Does that make sense? It gets even better. I said tefillah has three letters. The third letter, next slide, is the, the letter Aleph or Aleph. And it's a picture of a, a bull's head and, and, and it's going into a yoke and, and it means strength. It means, uh, it means the leader. And so to the ancient Hebrew, tefillah has this comic strip of the front of the head plus the sun setting in the west plus the picture of an ox head. And they understood prayer to mean turning our head to face the sun who has the strength. Now, how much more does Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30 make to us? When Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and I am humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. And he said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we pray, all we're doing is simply turning our head towards the son who has the strength. Is this not what prayer does for us? Right? Like we can probably all give a testimony to this where we, we've gone through something so heavy and so burdensome, but then in a moment of prayer, we've turned to Jesus and then all of a sudden we felt like our problems weren't really problems anymore. See, this is the definition of prayer that resonates with me on every single level. Prayer is about being God conscious instead of being self conscious. Prayer is any time we take the focus off of ourselves and we put it on God. In fact, calling on the name of the Lord has nothing to do with words at all. And that sounds very strange, doesn't it? And let me ask the room a question. And let's be honest. Have we ever sat through a prayer meeting and listened to somebody pray long-winded prayers? Raise your hand. Oh, good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. And it is hot in here, so I, I'm just going to unbutton my shirt. Don't get too excited. I, I'm just really hot. <laughs> I don't normally wear flannel. This is the first time wearing flannel. And you want to know what excites me about this shirt is that it matches my Ford blue shirt really well. So <laughs> let the anointing come, Lord. <laughs> get a zoom in on that there, Jeff. <laughs> so prayer has nothing to do with, with words. We all have sat through long-winded prayers. If I had a nickel for every time I had to sit through somebody pray a long-winded prayer, I would have enough that everybody would go home with a Ford F-150 today. We've all <laughs> sat through those prayer meetings. There was a guy in one of the churches that I pastored a long, long time ago. On Wednesday mornings at 7 o'clock, we'd meet at the church and we'd have prayer. And he'd always come late and he'd always turn his hearing aid off and he'd always speak really, 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 really obnoxiously loud. And he would come to the front of the church and he would just tell Jesus about his day. Like literally his prayer was, Lord, I woke up at 6.30 today. I was supposed to wake up at 6.35, but I woke up before my alarm did. And then I put my feet in my slippers, Lord. And then I walked over to my coffee machine, Lord, and I turned it on, Lord. And then Jesus, I went into the shower and I had a shower, Lord. And then I realized that I didn't have head and shoulders, Lord. And I had to use the no-name brand shampoo, Lord. Now I don't like how my hair smells, Lord. I'm supposed to smell like peaches, but I smell like apple, Lord. And then I came to prayer, Lord. And then I was late, like literally, literally. He's telling Jesus a play-by-play -play of his day, as if Jesus doesn't know. And then when he gets to the front and, and, and he's like, okay, now it's 7.30 and I can't predict the future, I'm going to start telling Jesus Bible stories. And then he starts talking to Jesus about any Bible story that's on his heart. And I'm not, I'm not saying this to like make fun of him or put a slam on him. I'm saying this because it, it's the best example of a long-winded prayer. And all he did was give God a play-by-play -play of his day. He just told God stories about stuff that God already knows about. And there's a huge, huge, huge difference between long prayers and long-winded prayers. Huge difference. I'm not saying don't pray long or don't pray hard. I'm saying we have, there's a difference between the two. And in fact, some people won't come out to prayer meetings because of people's long-winded prayers. They suck the life out of the room. Now let's tie this into the Sermon on the Mount. Next slide. In Matthew 6, verse 7 to 8, it says this. Jesus, how do you pray? Well, when you pray, when you tefillah, when you turn your heads towards the son who has the strength, he says, do not keep babbling like the Pentecostals do. <laughs> oh, my eyes are getting bad. My eyes are getting bad. Do not keep babbling. It's another P word. Like the pagans. Ooh, for they think they'll be heard because of many words. Jesus said, in case you didn't get the memo, guys, don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Read that again. Jesus said, long-winded prayers don't make us more spiritual. They make us more pagan. You still love me? Yeah, because nobody here prays long-winded prayers. That's why. <laughs> See, the word here for babbling like the pagans, it is the, it's a Greek word, and, and it's called battle logeo. Can you say that? Battle logeo. 
it, it literally means chatter. It, it, it means long-winded. It, it means to utter empty words. It means to stammer or to repeat yourself. In other words, Jesus is saying, when you go to call on the name of the Lord, we need to think about what we are actually saying. See, prayers is not about counting beads. It's not about reciting mantras. It's not an incantation. It's not a magical formula. It's not saying the right thing the right way at the right amount of time. We know this because the longest public prayer that Jesus ever prayed, it takes less than 15 seconds to read, which means that it took Jesus even less time to speak it. Yet scripture tells us over and over and over and over again that Jesus went off to pray. He went off to, he woke up early to pray. We read that in Mark chapter 1. In Matthew 14, he stayed up late to pray. In Luke 6, he climbed mountains to pray. And then again in Luke 6, he pulled an all-nighter to pray. In Luke 22, the Bible says that he withdrew from the crowds in order to go and pray. My question is, is what did Jesus say during those hours of prayer? When we read about where he was led into the desert to pray and fast and be tempted by Satan for 40 days, my question is, what on earth do you pray for 40 days and 40 nights straight? Next slide. Martin Luther was famous for saying that I have so much to do today that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. And I appreciate his piety. But honestly, who has that kind of time? 1 Thessalonians 5.17, next slide, says pray continually. How do we do that? I used to think that, 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 that not being able to pray for three hours straight made me unspiritual. And, and, and I used to think that, that not being able to pray for three hours straight made me less of a pastor. And there was a moment in my life where I would actually allow the enemy to start throwing darts at me and, and I start believing the lies and believing the accusations and I would start to feel guilty about not being able to pray for three hours straight. And that was until I came to this understanding that people who can pray for three hours straight and not be long-winded and not get bored and not get distracted Distracted, those people have a unique gift from the Holy Spirit and it's called intercession. And I don't have that gift. Now that doesn't mean that I don't pray. It doesn't mean that I don't strive to, to push myself to pray you know, harder or longer or more each and every day. It just means that because I'm not gifted with that gift, I have to rely on the rest of the body of Christ who is gifted with that gift. And I have to learn to partner and work with them and use that in the kingdom sense to build the church to move it forward. Listen, God is not always going to speak to me as the pastor for something. Sometimes he's going to use magna through a prophetic word Sometimes he's going to use uh, Mary with the gift of intercession and say, Pastor, while you were preaching, this was going on, and I think there's something to it, and I just want to let you know that I'm getting our intercessors to pray into that. I don't know what that means, but I trust her because she's using her gift, and we have to learn to work together. It doesn't mean she's better than me or I'm better than her. It just means God speaks to us in different ways. And he's got to do it in 30 seconds or less with me because of my attention. Not to put them in a box, but we have to work together. Right? But the scripture here says pray continually. It doesn't say, you know, to the intercessors of the church, pray continually. This is speaking to, to everybody. We are all encouraged to pray continually, not just the intercessors. Again, same question. How on earth do we do that? Because for a guy who isn't gifted with intercession, that sounds daunting. I got up and I said, hey, we're having 10 days of prayer. And if you're not an intercessor, you're like, oh my gosh, are we in heaven or hell? What is going on? Right? Because we're, we're gifted differently. How are we going to pray for 10 days? We have 40 hours to work this week. Our kids went back to school that is so stressful on, on so many families. We have families that we have to raise. We have a church that needs us to serve in. We have a community out there that needs us to serve them. We have multiple other obligations. Life gets busy. 
we're all tired. How do we pray continually when we can't even think of enough words to, or even keep focus through our distractions? How, how do we pray continually when the Bible tells us in Romans 8 that when we can't find the words to think or say that the Holy Spirit has to intercede with groanings on our behalf when we can't find the right words? And the answer to those questions is simple. All we have to do is simply turn our heads toward the Son who has the strength. Prayer is this pursuit of being completely God conscious. And then from there, we speak and do what the Holy Spirit is doing, no matter how mundane or monotonous or exciting it is. If we can just take a moment to become aware of the presence of God, it will change everything. Now, I don't know if I ruined your concept of prayer or I really encouraged you today, but for me, this is the most biblical, it's the most fulfilling, it's the most least burdensome definition of prayer that I know. And it's been that way since mankind first started to call in the name of the Lord way back in Genesis 4, chapter 6. So one more time, can we say tefillah? And this coffee is kicking in, praise the Lord. <laughs> tefillah, the second step. It's teshuva. We'll go on the next slide, please, Jen or Jeff. I don't know who's back there now. Everything's going blurry. Jen, rock star. Teshuva is the next step. It means change our thinking or, or change the way that we view things. Teshuva is also an exile term. We, we read this a lot in the, in, in the prophets. Uh, it means return. When, when the Hebrew people found themselves in slavery, the prophets would speak out. They would yell out, Teshuva. Return, return to this kingdom that's waiting over here for you. Teshuvah is also the Hebrew word for repentance. Now, Psalm chapter 51 is known as the Perek Teshuva. It's, it's, it, it, that translates to great chapter of repentance. And, and so just knowing what we learned from sin and iniquity and lust and transgression from last week, look at how the psalmist repented. I'm going to read it from the Bible today. I don't have it on the slide. But this is what Psalms 51 says. Everything that we've learned so far about this, it, just look at his language. It's not this, Lord, forgive me for my sin. He, he goes after everything. He's really rooting the problem out. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, right? The action steps around my lust and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict when I am justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all of my iniquity. Again, there's that difference. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. I will learn, in other words, I will learn so that the sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous and burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Teshuva has three letters. The first letter, next slide, is the letter Shin. Now the picture there, obviously these are primitive people. They're not the greatest artists. But they're interpreted to be um, fire. That's supposed to be fire there that, in that middle block. And, and it means consume or consuming. In other words, uh, shin is the letter for the consuming fire of God. The next letter in, in the word teshuv is the word vav. The picture is of a nail. And it means to add. It means to secure. It means to connect something. The third letter is a picture. That's supposed to be a picture of a tent 
or a house, and it literally means a house or a tent. And so to the ancient Hebrew, teshuva has this comic strip of fire plus nail plus house, and then they would understand repentance to mean the consuming fire of God connects us through a nail back to the house. In other words, when our sinful nature causes us to miss God's perfect mark, our house becomes broken. Our house becomes disconnected. We could say it this way. When we turn our head to face the one who has the strength, the consuming fire of God connects us back to him and restores us. Can we say teshuva? Now the third step is sadaka. Sadaka is a compound word. And we're going to unpack this more and more and more later on in the Sermon on the Mount series. But for now, we'll just go with this. This is a brief overview of this word. Um, It's it's Sadaka, but we have Sadak right there. Sadak means righteousness, right? And it has three letters. The first letter is the uh, the letter called Sadi. And that little squiggly line is actually supposed to be a guy laying on his side. And it means desire. It means needs. The second letter in Sadak is a Dalit. And that picture is a a tent door. Like we had the other letter. It was a tent. This is the tent door. It means pathway. It means to enter. It means to open the door. Uh, Kof. This, we've already talked about this, right? It, it's the sun on the horizon. Now, cough is by itself here, so it gives it a little bit of a different meaning. It still means sun on the horizon. It means behind you. It also means humility. And so to the ancient Hebrew, when they look at this word sadak, when they look at this word righteous, it has this comic strip of a man laying on his side, plus the picture of the tent door, plus the picture of the sun on the horizon. And they would interpret this word to mean needs are the pathway to humility. Now remember, sadaka is a compound word. It's got that ah sound at the end of it. Um, We see this a lot in Hebrew culture. When when, when It's the letter of grace, right? So Abraham went to Abraham, right? Every time we hear that ha sound in Hebrew, it it basically means God's grace has touched your life and there's going to be a notable change because of it. So the first three letters in sadaka are the same, but it's sadaka ha. There's that that ha sound at the end. And so the fourth picture is the letter he. And it's a picture literally of a man standing there with his arms raised and and this letter is interpreted to mean reveal or behold it it, it means let wind in it also means to let the spirit in so sadak is the hebrew word um, for for righteousness And, and since the paleo hebrew translates it as needs are the pathway to humility then sadaka means needs are the pathway to humility revealed Now, I met a friend uh, who was from Turkey when I was at a conference in New Mexico a couple years ago, and he spoke fluent Hebrew, and he spoke uh, fluent Aramaic, and I was talking to him about the Sadaka and Sadak, and he was looking at me like, "Uh, duh, you should know this. This is like Bible basics 101. How could you not know this? And I'm like, well, first off, we interpret the Bible way different than how it was originally intended, and, and there's a whole bunch of whitewashed stuff through it, and I'm starting to learn Hebrew a little bit, and you're the expert, so please explain to me what Sadak and Sadaka is. And he said this, he said, Adam, back home in Turkey, if I walk downtown, I will find beggars on the street begging. And do you know what they're yelling out to me as I pass by? They yell out, Sadaka, Sadaka, Sadaka. That's what they yell out. When, when begging for food, the poor people will yell out, show me your righteousness. See, Sadaka is righteousness revealed. It's generosity revealed. There is a part of righteousness that calls us to live right before God. Absolutely. 100%. But there is also a part of righteousness that we cannot ignore that calls the believer to be a generous person. 2,106 times in the Bible righteousness is framed in the context of our generosity. And somehow, Christians are known for not tipping at Swish LA on a Sunday. (laughs) Jesus says you got to be born again once, and we make a whole doctrine in life about it. 2,106 times he says your righteousness needs to be revealed through your generosity, and we say, nope, I'm going to be greedy, stingy, and cheap. 
it, and this is a problem. This is the problem. And we're going to unpack this later in our series. So can everybody say Sadaka? It's righteousness revealed. So as the worship team comes, let, let's bring last week, let's bring this week together, and hopefully we're going to find some practical applications. N number one is this, that, that whatever degree of sin that we struggle with, whether it's our thoughts, whether it's being consumed by our thoughts, whether it's putting action steps around our thoughts, Jesus forgives it all. And once we believe that, then we can move to a spot where we begin to take that belief and begin to transform it into a faith in Jesus. And we do that by first tefillah. We do that by prayer. We do that by calling on the name of the Lord, by turning our head to face the Son who has the strength. Romans 10 13 says this for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord next slide everyone who to feel us will be saved and as we call on the name of the Lord step three happens teshuva it begins to take place repentance starts to come into our life and the consuming fire of God begins to connect us back to him through his house now I don't know if this needs to be said to our church today or not but repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. You guys can play if you want. It's... Repentance is not just lip action. Repentance requires action. Repentance is a 180 degree change, very literally. It's walking this way and then all of a sudden you're doing a 180 degree and you're walking in the exact opposite direction. The problem that I found in the last 18 years of pastoring, 17 years pastoring in a church, is that so many Christians have struggled with the same sin for the last 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 50, 60, sometimes 70 years. And what I've discovered is that we've gone a lifelong uh, relationship with Jesus just saying sorry for the same thing over and over and over again. And we've never actually repented. True repentance is not just saying sorry. I'm not eliminating that prayer time with God where you turn your head to the, to the son who has the burden. We, we got to do that. They're out of the heart, the mouth speaks. We have, to, we have to say that we're sorry, but it doesn't stop there. It's saying sorry is one thing, but we live a lifestyle of teshuva. We live a lifestyle of repentance, and we have to say sorry, but then we have to come up with a game plan so that we don't fall down that downward spot the next time and this is where we get this so wrong in the church repentance could mean it could come in the form of counseling if we have an anger problem are we going to keep saying sorry to our wives for the next 5 10 15 20 years for flying off the handle in anger or are we going to say sorry and actually prove it to them and if we need to go and get our anger checked by going to see a counselor start dishing that out Repentance it comes in the form of accountability if we can't control what we're watching on the internet. Sometimes repentance comes in the form of discipline if we just can't get motivated. I want to pastor a group of people that, yes, say sorry, but really, truly repent and then set up guard places in place so that we don't go down that same path and keep hurting the people that we're trying to win to Jesus. You got to walk the walk and you got to talk the talk. And then when we repent, the Lord begins to do something in our hearts and it moves us to the place of Sadaka, which transforms us so that our righteousness can begin to be revealed to other people. We read this so beautifully in the story of Zacchaeus. He was the most greedy, stingy, richest, inward focused man that anyone has ever met. He has this encounter with the risen Christ and he says, oh, I'm gonna pay back everybody that I've robbed. And this spirit of generosity, the spirit of Sadaka, his righteousness was revealed and he did say sorry, but he also put his money where where his mouth was and he stopped ripping people off there was a change a tangible change that happened in his life and it requires all of us to take action see following Jesus is not a spectator sport 
It's a participator's forum where everybody has to get involved. So now I hope that James 2.17 makes even more sense. Next slide. That in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. James didn't say, hey, if it's not accompanied by words, it's dead. He said, if it's not accompanied by action, it's dead. Anybody can talk the talk. It takes the Holy Spirit living in us to walk the walk. And in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, it's dead. In other words, faith without our righteousness being revealed is dead. And so now the question becomes, what does righteousness revealed look like? And that, my friends, <laughs> is where Jesus' manifesto, his Sermon on the Mount, begins to apply to our lives. As we close out, I just want to quote Robin Myers one last time. It says this, there's not a single word in that sermon about what to believe. It's only words about what to do. It is a behavioral manifesto, not a propositional one. Last slide. Faith in Jesus is not just believing the right thing. Faith in Jesus is an action. And let me tell you, it is the best way to live life. And it's built around tefillah, teshuva, Sadaka, And this is a daily thing. And I love these Hebraic concepts and I wanted to unpack them with my church family today because this isn't just about saying a magic prayer and then, and then going to get to go to heaven one day. This is, this is, uh, um, these are concepts that enable us to say every single day that we can pick up our cross and follow Him. That every single day when the going gets tough and the tough gets going, that we can turn our head to the one who has the strength to bear our burdens. That, that every day we can repent and he'll restore us back to him. And every day with God's help, our righteousness can be revealed to those around us. So can we say one last time this morning, Tefillah, Teshuva, Tzedakah. Beautiful. Do I got time to tell one last story? You got, you're not bored? This is a story of epic failure dumb on my part yesterday. <laughs> I got up and said how awesome God is and how much he moved in his baptism, but it didn't start that way. We got out to Wasega Beach about an hour before everybody did yesterday. And we had to pick up a veggie tray and a fruit tray at Walmart. Never been to a Sega Beach in my life, but uh, I'm there in my bathing suit and a t-shirt and everybody's literally like bundled up. I thought we were in the wrong place. Mel runs into Walmart there to, to get this veggie tray and I decided to take the kids to Tim Hortons because I wanted a nice coffee. And um, we're in the Tim Hortons lineup and I didn't see this until we were almost at the window and there was this homeless man sleeping next to the drive through and all he had was a shopping cart with him with maybe five or six items in it and he had this ratty old blanket that he was using as a pillow and and I said out loud Man, we're at Walmart. We should probably go get the guy's sleeping bag. And I'm like, we're in the drive-thru at Tim Hortons. I could ask the person at the window, hey, just throw in a $20 gift card. And I could hop out and just give it to the guy and go. But I didn't do it. The reason why I didn't do it is because there was this sense in me that I'm like, oh, I'm an hour early, but I have to be an hour early. Otherwise, I'm going to be late. And my son is in the back seat of the truck and we see this guy and he's sleeping with all of his belongings in a cart and here my wife and I are complaining that our kitchen's not big enough in the new house that we bought and my son says dad we got to do something about it and I said to him yeah Jack you're absolutely right buddy don't ever lose that heart but I said there's nothing we can do right now if we see somebody later on, we'll, we'll do something. We'll do something. I promise we'll do something. But dad, he doesn't have a pillow. He doesn't have a blanket. Can we go back? Can we do something? 
We just drove off, went to the baptism. And I felt like I needed to tell that story today because some people think pastors are perfect. I'm not that pastor. I do not have this all together. Every time I get up to preach, you need to know that I'm preaching to myself. This, when I preach, I try to preach best case scenario. I try to preach from where God is leading me on in my walk with Him. And I don't have this Sadaka thing perfect. I don't have this generosity spirit all worked out in my life. I make mistakes in front of my kids when they are saying, ah, Dad, we can do something about it. Why aren't you doing it? I said my son's name is Jack. My God is gracious. That was the prophetic utterance of his character that was coming out. I just wanted to share that with you. It's not to be a Debbie Downer this morning, but I hope it comes as an encouragement that me too, I am trying to figure this thing out. And so my prayer is that, that we would be a group of people that... Yes, we're saved. Yes, we're redeemed. Yes, we're forgiven. And we can be excited about that. But it's not just so that we can feel good and, and know that we're going to go to heaven one day when we die. But we're saved and we're redeemed so that when we see people in need and we can do something about it, that we get out of our car, that we do something physical around that to show what Jesus has done inside of us. If all we ever do is talk about it without demonstration, oh my gosh, we're going nowhere. So let's stand this morning. And let's pray together. My prayer is that the Spirit of God would come and do something in our heart broken and what sin is destroyed. God, I thank you for sending Jesus to save us. And that we are forgiven, that we're redeemed, that, that one day we'll get to spend a heaven in heaven in eternity with you. And God, we also thank you that, that our faith isn't just a belief, but, but it's an action that, that we can base our lives around. God, I thank you that you are compassionate with us, that you are gracious towards us, that you are slow to anger with us, that you are abounding in love towards us. And God, thank you for our time together. And we ask you for your help to live in a way that brings glory to your name. God, our prayer this morning is that we would be a group of people with strong faith. And where that faith is weak, or where we want to use excuses to not practice righteousness being revealed in our lives, for those areas, God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would help us and that we wouldn't be stuck in just a belief, but that we would be compelled to action. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. I don't know what song the worship team has for us to close out with this morning, but I would encourage us before we, we leave today that as this song is being played, that we would just focus on what the Spirit of God is saying to our hearts this morning. Don, you can...